he didn't leave it up to us to decide truth. He left it he left it up to him because I'm really glad that it's not up to me because my truth would not be not be very good at all. Uh, <laughs> I'm not so much of a persuasion that, that truth is, um, that starts with, with me as the origin, that what I define truth is truth, because I think truth is, is actually um, uh, more absolute than that, and it's, truth is, um, is truth even if I don't believe in it, for example. Perception is reality, so you really have to keep an eye on like what your perception is and you know uh, compare it to what the truth says in the Bible to make sure you're... Um, believing the right things. Sometimes it seems that's hard to know, but if you know the Bible, and you've read the Bible, and you've studied the Bible, and you let your heart prosper in the Bible, then I think you can, I think you're going to come to the truth. And sometimes it takes the work of the Holy Spirit to work that out. You know, your understanding may not be perfect that day, but that's, you know, the, the daily learning process that we go through. and. Ideally, the, you know, the older you get, the more wisdom you get, and the closer you'll get to being able to figure out what that truth is. The greatest story ever. We could debate what's the greatest story ever. Somebody would say Romeo and Juliet. Uh, somebody would say Gone with the Wind. Somebody would say Braveheart or Gladiator. It just depends on your perspective. One of my friends would say... Dumb and dumber. Um, so it's all, you know, different perspective. But, but what we know as followers of Jesus is that this book is the greatest story ever. The Bible is the greatest story ever. And, and that, that's not just a sort of a subjective thing. If you look at historically uh, book sales through history, as best as people can figure out who study this sort of thing, uh, 500 million copies have been printed of Don Quixote. 200 million copies of A Tale of Two Cities. 150 million copies of The Lord of the Rings. 107 million copies of Harry Potter, The Sorcerer's Stone. It's a little more modern. The Bible, around 5 billion. Numerically, the Bible wins. Now, people, some people would have you believe, oh, but nobody reads the Bible anymore. They really don't print Bibles anymore. An average, 100 million copies of the Bible are printed every year in more languages than any other book on the planet. So no matter what people tell you, since we're talking today about truth, the truth is the Bible is still presently the best-selling book in the history of the world, and every year it wins again because it is the story of truth. It's the story of God's truth. We've been walking through the Bible together, and we've been trying to really understand uh, this, this picture of the Bible, and we're talking particularly about the, the last third of the Bible, the New Testament. We're using this, this, uh, the books of the Bible, which is just simple uh, book introductions, and then the books of the New Testament. And we've been walking through this together. We're in week seven of walking through this. And we've been thinking of this unique framework of, as Christians, uh, we are Trinitarian. We believe in one God who exists eternally, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we've been looking at the story from these three perspectives. First, the, the master storyteller, God the Father. And God the Father is the master storyteller. He's the one who is the author of truth. God cannot lie. God speaks only the truth. God the Father is truth. And so we, we kind of, when I'm up here, I'm talking about the, the Father's perspective on our topic. And then Jesus Christ, God the Son. When I'm here, I kind of talk about Jesus Christ, God the Son. And Jesus Christ is the truth. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus came to reveal us, to show us what the truth of the Father looks like. And, and then the Holy Spirit. The story continues as the Holy Spirit moves in our lives today. So when I'm down here, I'm talking about how the Holy Spirit of God, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is still leading us in the truth. In a world that is, is, is really speaking falsehood in so many ways, it's the Spirit of God who whispers into our heart, that's not true. And we know when you're going to tell a lie to someone else, you have to first almost lie to yourself. We, we can self-deceive. We can deceive others. But the Spirit of God isn't deceived. Because God is truth. The Spirit who, if you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit who lives in you will say to you, that's not true. Now, you may go ahead and say it anyways. You may not live the way you should. But you know there's a conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. Because God, by his spirit, wants to lead us into a lifestyle of walking in the truth. And so today we're going to think about this idea of truth and how, how the Bible really is the story of truth. 
And, and I want to think also about this issue of truth because we live in a time where some people say, well, I don't believe in truth. Or you have your truth, I have my truth. All truth is subjective. Some people would say there is no absolute truth. But I believe on the topic of truth, there's only two kinds of people. There's those who believe in absolute truth and there's those who say they don't believe in absolute truth, but they still do. I think everybody believes in absolute truth. There's this person, I believe there's absolute truth, they base it in something, I base it in the Bible. They say, I believe there's things that are absolutely true and they're true because they're true and they don't change. And then there's people who say, I don't believe in absolute truth. And I say to them, you, do you believe that absolutely? They say, yes, I do. <laughs> you getting the problem there? <laughs> to declare you don't believe in absolute truth and you're certain of it is a statement of absolute truth. Therefore, you now do believe in absolute truth. It's just that you choose to believe that there is an absolute truth. Everybody get that? Okay, we'll come back to that. No, we won't. That's enough there. But, uh, but, but I want to talk about truth because the, 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 if, if God, if our God, the Father, is absolute truth and never lies and speaks the truth, if God the Father came incarnate into human history to show us what truth looks like, and if the Holy Spirit, who is called the Spirit of truth, wants to lead us, we better know what that truth is. So we're going to look at First and Second Peter, these two little general epistles, these general letters written to groups of Christians in the ancient world because the topic of truth comes up over and over and over in these two little books. And if you've been doing the reading or if you're going to do it this coming week, you'll read through First and Second Peter. And so I'm going to share with you six different things we can learn about truth. There's a space in your, in your bulletin if you're a note taker to write down those six things if that's helpful. If that's distracting for you, don't do it. Just listen. But if it's helpful to keep notes, feel free to write those things down. That's there for you. Six things about truth that we learn from First and Second Peter that we learn from this greatest story ever in the New Testament. Number one, the truth about who you are. You have to know who you are. And we can think about, you know, I, I base who I am on lots of things. We can say, well, I base who I am on my national, my nation of origin or my, my background. So I'm an American or I'm a Guatemalan or I'm a German. And, I, and that can be part of our identity of who we are. And, and that's, that's part of us. Who am I? It can be our job. I'm a teacher. I'm a lawyer. I'm a pastor. That's who I am. We can kind of identify ourselves around our work, our abilities. I'm a writer. I'm a dancer. I'm a, you know, I can do this. Therefore, that's who I am. Our role. I'm a husband. I'm a wife. I'm an aunt. I'm an uncle. I'm a neighbor. I have certain roles. And that defines, well, that's part of it. Um, our, our political persuasion, our political party, I am a, and fill in the blank. Anyway, all these things, and there's nothing wrong with any of those in terms of kind of getting a sense of who we are. But don't base who you are, if you're a Christian, primarily on any of those things. Base who you are on what God says about you. Because who you are according to the world or your own definition can change and ebb and flow because you, know, you can feel good one day or somebody can, you can be up and down. But what God says about you is so critical. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. And you, the page numbers for this will also be on the screen if you're using your reading guide, the Books of the Bible reading guide. And listen to these words. I want to talk about truth. And this is the truth about if, if you've come to the cross and you've received Jesus, whether it was three days ago or 50 years ago, if you've confessed your sins and received Jesus Christ as your Savior, and he's entered your heart and your life, and you are now his disciple, you've been saved, now you're walking with him and learning, learning to walk with Jesus, though imperfectly, you're learning to walk with Jesus. If that's you, this is what the Bible says, this is the truth about you. Look at chapter two of 1 Peter, beginning of verse four. As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, listen closely to verse five. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In that little passage, at least two things that should blow your mind if you're a Christian. First of all, you are a living stone that's part of God's holy household. Jesus Christ is the headstone, the cornerstone, the capstone. He holds it all together. He divines the parameters and the boundaries. Jesus sets the tone of who we are. But when you become a Christian, you become a living stone built into his household. You are part of his family, part of his household. That's an amazing privilege. If you're a Christian, say, I'm a living stone and part of God's holy family. That's why we gather like this, because we're part of something bigger than ourselves. And then, and then Peter goes on. 
being built in a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are a holy priesthood. Do you understand that if you come to the cross and receive Jesus, God says, you are my holy or my royal priesthood. Now, if you come from certain church backgrounds, you look and say, oh, no, no, I, there's priests and then there's me. And then the way it works is, you know, I go, if I do something wrong, I go and talk to the priest, and then the priest talks to God for me, and then the, God tells the priest what I'm supposed to do to make it right, and the priest tells me, but I don't go right to God. I go through this priest. No, no, no. If you're a Christian, you are a holy, royal priesthood, and you have absolute personal access to the God of heaven. Do you hear that? Yes. If you're a Christian... You have the same act, and there's no pastor, there's no priest, there's no religious leader who stands between you and God. So as a pastor, all the people come to me and say, Pastor, uh, will you pray about this? They'll start talking about a prayer need, and I get this sense when they're talking, they have this feeling that if I pray for them, somehow God's going to hear more than if they pray. And when I feel that, I say, I say, wait, can I ask you a question? Do you feel like somehow my prayer or my blessing is going to have more power than yours? And oftentimes I'll say, oh yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> And I'll say, it's not. It's not. And when that happens, I normally say, I'm going to pray with you, but you have to pray too. Because your prayers are, God hears your prayers just as much as he hears mine. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that the, the curtain in the, in the temple, the most holy place that was between the holy place and the most holy place, was torn in two from top to bottom. This picture of God ripping it open and saying, once through, through, the, through the blood of Jesus, you come to the Father and you have complete access. When you are, if you've been a Christian two days, two minutes, you have absolute access to the God of heaven because you are a royal priest. Someone say amen. amen. That's the truth. Deal with it. But I don't feel like a royal priesthood. <laughs> I don't feel like a living stone. Then grow into it and walk into it and live into it. But that's who you are. But it doesn't end there. It, there's more. Wait, there's more. Don't order yet. Don't you like, like those guys with all the little things on TV, right? Wait, 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 there's more. Listen to this. Look at verse 9, 1 Peter chapter 2. But you are a chosen people, chosen by God, a royal priesthood. There it is again. A holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Wow. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is who you are if you're a Christian. This is who you will become if you come to the cross and receive Jesus. And we live in a culture that builds people up and tears them down and builds them up and tears them down. And we live in a culture that will tell you lies about yourself and that will, a culture that will, that will kind of systematically beat you down till you feel like nothing. And God says, this is the truth. This is who you are. You are a living stone. You are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen people. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession. Someone say Amen. That is the truth, and you're getting lied to every day of your life. And you got to walk in this truth. You have to walk in the truth. You have to live in the truth. I, when I think about our culture, there, there, there's no more kind of current, modern moment right now that I've seen it where how culture builds someone up and then, then just loves to tear them down than Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods, you know, not only called the best golfer ever, but at one point on the cover of one, one magazine, the best athlete, not of the year, not of the decade, of the century. And then somebody struggles, and they're having a hard time, and everybody piles on and wants to tear him down. And, and yet, it's not what the world says about you or doesn't say about you, and it's not this roller coaster of who you are. It's not even how you feel about yourself. But God says, this is the truth. This is who you are. You come to the cross. You receive Jesus Christ. You have his forgiveness. The spirit, the spirit of God moves into you and you walk in that spirit. And you are a chosen, special possession of the living God. And nothing and no one will ever change that. That's good news. Hold on to that. But pastor, you don't understand. You don't understand. The, the person who told me, I do, I will, till death do us part, has walked away and left me feeling vacant and broken. And God would say, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a person belonging to the living God, his special possession. I don't feel that way. That's who you are. Hold on to that in those moments. But pastor, I've applied for the same job four times, for the same promotion four times, and they've passed over me, passed over me, passed over me, passed over me. I don't feel chosen. I feel rejected. And God says, you are my chosen son, my chosen daughter. Hold on to that. Live into that. That's who you are. And the reason we have to know the truth of God is there's so many things telling us what isn't true. And so, so I encourage you to go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and to dwell on this, to think about this. this was, I, I memorized the, the book of 1 Peter when I was a sophomore in college. And I was, trying, I, was trying to, I was trying to get junk out of my mind, the good stuff in my brain, and there was so much junk in my mind, and in about four or five months I memorized all five chapters because whenever my mind was going to junky places, I would put good stuff in, which meant I was always going the wrong place and putting good stuff in. So I memorized and memorized, and this, this became part of my soul. And as a young Christian, I started to understand this is my identity. This is who I am. Yeah, I'm part of a human family. Yeah, I'm part of, I've got different, I've got abilities and gifts, but this is who I am. That's the truth. Walk in that, live in that, celebrate that. That's the truth. So, a question, just, just for, your, for your reflection. Will you live in the truth by declaring who God has made you through faith in Jesus. I am a living stone. I'm a holy priesthood. I'm a chosen nation, a chosen people, a holy nation. I'm God's special possession. Will you just start to declare that in your own life? I'm not talking about some made up mantra, I'm this, I'm this, that isn't true. I'm talking about declare the truth. This is who you are through faith in Jesus. And grow, if I don't feel that way, then grow into it, walk into it, and become more of who God wants you to be. Hold to that truth. Second, the truth about living in this world. What's the truth about living in this world? 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from the sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans. That means all those that don't believe in Jesus. Live such good lives among non-believers that though they accuse you of being wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. What is Peter saying to us? Uh, the, the, the truth about this world. First he says this. This world is not your home. This world is not your home. You are a foreigner. You are an exile. This home is not your permanent location. Heaven is our home. And this is the temporary stopover. And I had this pastor, when I was a young pastor, I had this pastor that used this line. He'd use it all the time. And I thought it was goofy and silly, but it stuck in my brain and I've never forgot it. So I'm going to give you a goofy, silly statement that I hope will stick in your brain too. He would say this. He'd say, listen, don't drive the tent pegs of your life too deep into the soil of this earth. Don't drive the tent pegs too deep, he says, because this is not your home. Keep your tent pegs loose because you never know when God's going to call you to the next thing, to the next place, and someday to him. Now let me be clear. God has made a beautiful world. If you, if you live in the Salinas Valley, man, when I, when I drive through the Salinas Valley, if it's sunrise or sunset, the, the way the, the, you ever seen the shadow on the shadows on the hills when the sun's rising? It's just beautiful. And the, all of the plenty of all that land's beautiful. You go lo, drive along the coast here. There's few places more beautiful than where we live. God's made us a beautiful world with wonderful people and great meaning and purpose. And we should fully drink in this life and enjoy it and live for Jesus in this life. I'm not speaking against this life. This life is a gift from God. But this world is not your home if you're a Christian. There is more. And when you know that, and when you know you're a chosen people, a royal priest, a holy nation, your perspective changes. And you keep those tent pegs a little bit looser. You don't hold on to things quite as tightly because you realize that there's more that lies ahead. And also, Peter says, there's a war going on. There's a battle. Abstain from the sinful desires which wage war against your soul. This world throws all kinds of temptations at us. The enemy of your soul throws all kinds of temptations at you. And you have to say, I'm going to fight against that. I'm going to resist that. Because there's more than this life. And if your attitude is, here's my goal, to drink in everything I can every moment of this life and to get all that I can for me, you're missing the point. But if you say, this world is not my home and I'm God's person, I can enjoy this life and I can enjoy the blessings that God gives and be deeply grateful but I live with a bigger vision that goes beyond myself and beyond this life. So here's the question. Will you live in the truth by making your life a living testament to God's presence, God's goodness, and God's grace? 
that no matter what you face, when you know that heaven is your home, when you know who you really are, you bring the love and the grace of Jesus wherever you go. And, and, and so Peter says, so even if people, even if people come against you, when well, they want to accuse you of doing wrong things, they can't because they see the good deeds that you're doing and they glorify God. Someone looks at you and they want to make false, false accusations, but they can't because everyone knows that's not who she is. That's not how she lives. That's not who he is. He's, he's not that. People know because you're living for Jesus. Let your life reflect the presence and the power and the glory of Jesus. We have to know the truth. We have to live in the truth. Number three, the truth about suffering. This is so important. So important. We think that when we suffer, most of us in our minds, when something bad happens, we think, what did I do wrong? This is payback. This is, you know, that, that's Eastern mysticism. That's yin and yang and karma. You do this I, you know, this, I do this, this happens to me. But that's not what the Bible teaches. There's times you can do everything right and still suffer. And that's what, that's what we're taught here. Look at 1 Peter 3, verses, uh, verses 14, and then we'll jump to 17 through 18. But even if you should suffer for what is, what does it say? Right. <laughs> even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. For it is be- Verse 17, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for our sin- once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Peter says, understand this. This is the truth. There are times you will suffer in this life and it has nothing to do with anything wrong you did. It might be that you're suffering just because you're following Jesus. And I think that may become more and more the reality in the coming years all around the world. It is the reality in some parts of the world right now where Christians are being, we have brothers and sisters, Coptic Christians in Egypt who are suffering and being killed just for their faith, not for doing anything wrong. And I think that may grow in other parts of the world and it may grow even in this part, in our part of the world. But we, we often think when something goes wrong, boy, what did I do wrong? Now, here's the reality. Do we sometimes suffer because we do dumb things? What's the answer? Yes. yes. Okay, so I'm not saying that isn't the case. But sometimes we suffer, sometimes we go through hard times, and we're doing things right. And then Peter uses the perfect example. He says, look at Jesus. He never sinned. He never did anything wrong. And they spit in his face, they mocked him, they scourged him, and they nailed him to a cross, and he bore our sins. Not because he did anything wrong, but as a sacrifice for us. And if you follow Jesus, there may be times when you suffer for doing the right thing. And in those moments, you say, then I'm just becoming more like Jesus. To be a Christian is to walk in the path of Jesus. And Jesus did the right things and he suffered. There's times where you're gonna do the right things and you're gonna suffer for it. When that happens, say, Jesus, hold me close, give me strength. And in those moments, you just close your eyes and think of Christ on the cross and say, Jesus, you gave everything for me, you did nothing wrong. And so as I suffer right now for the right things, give me strength to stand strong that the world may see that you're still alive. But all suffering isn't because we've done something wrong. Sometimes we're doing the right things. That's the truth. So, Will you live in the truth by recognizing that you can do the right things and still suffer? Will you just just realize that there's times where you're going to be following Jesus faithfully and you might not get a, a promotion because you're living for Jesus. You're following Jesus and you might not have something happen that because you're being faithful to Christ. And say, Jesus, that's part of the journey. But I will keep following Jesus no matter what. Number four, the truth about the truth. What is the truth about the truth? 2 Peter chapter 1 addresses this in verse 12. Peter says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I love this. He says, You know the truth and you're firmly established in it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to tell you about it again. I'm going to remind you of these things. Look at verse 13. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Peter's saying, as long as I'm living, I'm gonna keep reminding you of the truth because I know that I will soon put it aside, meaning his body, this life, he's gonna die, and our Lord Jesus Christ has made this clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Peter says, I know you know the truth and I know you're firmly established on the truth, so I'm gonna keep telling it to you. Why? Why? Because the truth leaks. We forget. 
There's things we know are true and we hold with conviction. And then all of a sudden we look at ourselves and go, I'm not living the way I know I should be living. I think that's one of the reasons we gather like this every single week with God's people to open this book and to hear the truth again, to be reminded of what we already know. So I commend you for being here. We have people online in our online community. And I would say to our online community, I'm speaking to you right now in our online community on on our TV and computer. If you're right in town here and you could be at church right now and you're not, we have a third service starting in about an hour. Be here. Um, (laughs) But if you can be here, come. But if you can't be here and we have people all over the world that are part of our online community, that's fine. And if you're traveling somewhere, Go to find a Bible-believing church and go there among God's people. You can watch online, that's fine. But I, I'd say better than that is go to a Bible-believing Christian church and sit among God's people and sing songs of praises with God's people. This is a privilege. There's parts of the world where people will be persecuted for doing what we're doing right now, just sitting in this room together. We can do this still, praise God. And we get together to remember what we already know. You ever, you ever hear me preach sometimes or one of our pastors preach and you think, well, you said that before, I know that. You ever, heard, you ever had that feeling? Uh-huh, You know you should read your Bible every day? You ever hear that one? Yeah. Um, (laughs) Why do we remind people? Because we forget the truth. So, the truth about truth. Uh, Also, 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21 says this. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This book is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, and it holds the truth of God. So here's the question. Will you live in the truth by reading, remembering, and living the Word of God, the Bible? Yeah, there's 100 million Bibles printed every year in more languages than any other book. But the power of God's Word is not having it sit on your shelf. It's having it live in your heart and fill your mind. That's why every single day, all year long, we have a reading guide for you on the website and in the bulletin. Every day of the year, 365 days a year. Because this book is the truth in a world that at times feels like a tidal wave of lies just beating against our lives. And so every day you open this book and every day you read it. And how do you read the Bible? I mean, who, who, love, who loves a good occasional Greek word, a Greek root word in their sermon? Who loves a good Greek word occasionally? Just, can I get an amen? Can I see that hand? Praise the Lord. Okay, thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. So let me give you a couple words here Greek, Greek, uh, from, from the Greek. Exegesis and eisegesis. Ex, and if you, if you want them spelling, there you go. Exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis, we get the word exit, exhale, right? Exegesis is you open the Bible and, and you let the truth of God, exit the word of God, come out of the word of God and enter your heart and your mind and your life. Exegesis is reading the Bible saying, God, speak to me, teach me, I will take what you have and I'll receive it. Eisegesis is putting into it. We come to the Bible with our preconceived notions, our decisions, and we decide what we want the Bible to say and then we try to make the Bible agree with us. Don't do that. (laughs) We can can do do eisegesis where we're coming in and posing. I want the Bible to say this so I can find and look around and take this verse, that verse, put it all together and shake it up in a Yahtzee thing, throw it out and say, Yahtzee, it says what I wanted. But that's not what you do with the Bible. We do exegesis, Spirit of God. We said, Spirit of God, you live in me. Bring the truth to my life, which means we walk a journey for a lifetime of reading this book, and when the truth that God speaks from his word comes out and challenges my heart, my mind, and my lifestyle, I change to adjust to the word of God. That's exegesis. That's good biblical interpretation. What we try to do sometimes is go to the Bible, take what I want to do and what I think, and impose it on the Bible and make it agree with me. That's called biblical abuse. Don't do that. And I can, tell, can I tell you, as a Christian, I still have those moments. I'm in Scripture, and God will point something out in my character, my behavior, my words, my life, and I'm, I realize, man, I'm wrong. I'm out of line with God's Word. Now i got to decide. Do I line my life up with the Word of God? Or do I try to change the Word of God to line up with my life? And, and my life journey is trying to learn to make my life align with the Word of God. I don't do it perfectly all the time, and I still have a lot to learn. So I keep reading this book every single day. God, speak to me. God, speak to us. The truth about the truth. Number five, the truth about falsehood. The truth about falsehood. 2 Peter 2, 1 and 2. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. 
bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many, sadly, many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. There have been false teachers. There will be false teachers. And we have to be very careful of this. One of the reasons that we have anyone in a teaching role at Shoreline, they have to be a member of the church, is because we have a basic doctrinal statement that's the core teaching of the Bible. And we protect our children and our youth and make sure that those that are teaching are teaching the Bible. Why? Because there's people who are misled. They may sometimes intentionally, sometimes accidentally. But we want to guard the truth. There is falsehood out there. And it's pounding on people's lives. And if young people and children can't come to church and hear the truth, man, where are they going to get it? They're going to get it in their homes, and they're going to get it in their church. Hopefully some Christian friends. But we're going to battle for the truth and hold to the truth and battle against falsehood. So here's the question. Will you live in the truth by recognizing falsehood and standing against it? Will you, when something's false... Will you stand against it? Will you say, I do not believe that's true. I disagree with that, and I stand against it. Now, let me be very, very clear. We live in a world that is so polemical, so argumentative, and so conflict-oriented that people can't even have conversations anymore. It's heartbreaking what's happening in our culture, what's happening in our world. But we can disagree with people and still love them. How do I know that? Because I'm married. <laughs> I've been married for 33 years. And in those 33 years, there's probably been five or six times that we've disagreed, huh, honey? Yeah, she just said, no, that's not true. No, um, but, and, and, and there's times where Sherry just has to explain to me, Kevin, you're wrong, and that's how it goes. Um, but but uh, no, I, I love my wife. There's times we disagree, but I don't stop loving her, and, I, I don't, and I'm not mean and nasty to her. You can agree to disagree with someone without being disagreeable. That same pastor who told me the tent peg things, that was his, his line too. Uh, you can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. We've got to learn to be able to look at somebody and say, I love you, I appreciate you, I totally disagree with you. Let's talk about why. Let's have a conversation. We hold to the truth, and when we see something that's false, we stand against it, but we can, we can stand against it with a graciousness and with a kindness and a smile on our face. We don't have to punch people, scream at people. And, and listen, if you're a person that gets online and writes harsh, nasty things online that you'd never say face-to-face, but you stay online, don't, don't do that. There's so much that that viciousness, oh, nobody's gonna ever see me. I can just kind of throw out this, spew out this poison. Boy, as Christians, we, we season what we say with grace, but we speak the truth and we do it in love. Amen? Amen. Number six, the truth about the future. 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Jesus will return again someday. That's the truth about the future. When? I don't know. Who knows? Certainly not the person who wrote the most recent book about when Jesus is going to return again. People write books about it over and over and over again. They don't know because you know what Jesus said? He said, I don't know. The Father alone knows. How does that work? I don't know. I know that God the Father knows. Jesus said, I don't know. That's for the Father alone. So when somebody tells me, but I do know what Jesus doesn't know, I get really nervous when somebody thinks that they're smarter than Jesus. But he will return. And he will come in power. And he will come in glory. But almost all the teaching in the Bible about the return of Jesus is not about us figuring about when. It's telling us how we should live until he returns. Live holy and godly lives so that when, so that, oh, good catch. So that when Jesus returns, I'll get that later. Uh, live holy and godly lives so that when Jesus returns, you're ready to meet him. You're not saying, oh man, I wish I wasn't doing this, living here, acting that way, behaving that way. I, I feel like I'm ready to meet Jesus. That's part of our journey of faith. That's where the Holy Spirit fills us to walk with him and to live in him. The truth is Christ will return again. The truth is, no one knows exactly when. Except this. It's soon. It's been soon for 2,000 years. <laughs> but live ready to meet Jesus. Many in our world say truth is totally subjective. But the word of God says, our God who is truth has revealed his truth. Know his truth, love his truth, walk in his truth, share his truth, do it with grace. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are a God who brings us truth. That Jesus, you are the truth. 
Help us to know your truth, to live in your truth, and to walk in that truth. And Jesus, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us wisdom and discernment, that we might, that we might share this good news of your truth and your love and your grace wherever you send us. Jesus, thank you that you have not left us floating in a sea, drifting, having no moorings and no clarity, but you've given us clear truth for every part of our lives. Let us love your word, grow in your word, and follow it faithfully. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.